Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. And today we are going to diagnose and fix one of the Atari CPU boards. But first let's deal with an issue that bothers some people and that is extraneous noise. Well, extraneous noise in this case, for instance, the pinball machines buzzing and hissing and all that sort of stuff. That is just part of the repair process. I mean, if I had a machine that had a big gash in the side of the cabinet, do you want me to cover it up so you don't have to look at it? No, that's uh, that's part of the repair process, is looking at ugly things and listening to ugly things. I gotta go through it, and since I'm taking you on the journey, that's just the way it is. There's also gonna be other noises it's cold right now, really cold. So you may hear my uh, my heater that's not too far away from the workbench. Uh, my uh, bird may start screaming. That's just part of it. I have thought about going through and editing the audio, but uh, I don't think I'm going to do that because that's just part of uh, that's just part of the repair process and the environment that it's being done in. I welcome your comment and comments on that issue. But on to the subject. Uh, you may remember that along with the uh, pinball machines I got, I got 21 of these boards that were thrown into the deal. And I did a first pass on them, basically just plugging them into a machine and at first none of the 21 boards worked. There were various issues. Uh, some, uh, some of the issues became obvious after a while just looking at it. One thing I found interesting was that uh, see, uh, see the crystal over here? It's a 4 meg crystal and I don't know it doesn't show up really well but it's banged up pretty good on top. What happens is it sticks out more than a lot of the other stuff and on about three or four boards the crystal was gone. I mean I didn't uh, I didn't look for it specifically but it was broken off from the board specifically. Now when looking at this board what I noticed was that even though the crystal was there the uh, solder joints were broken badly and it wasn't making contact. So uh, I resoldered the joints and uh, got some activity out of it, but uh, along with that, I replaced the ROMs with 2732s over here and made some mods on it that we'll talk about. So I can I can quickly change ROMs and use these in different machines. And other than that, some of these uh, solenoid drivers over here were also bent over all the way, as were all of the uh, bypass capacitors. Legs were broken off, and without even testing the game, what I did was I replaced all of the ones that were broken because. Uh, when they're broken, what can what can happen is you turn on the machine and the solenoids activate and eventually either pop a fuse or start smoking. So there was a little bit of preventive work I did on this, but other than that, this board does not work right now. I put it in a machine and basically what happened was the display was flickering, the light bulbs were all on on full intensity which uh, that shouldn't happen because when the board's running even if the lights are stuck on they uh, they shouldn't be that bright and uh, so we have a non-working board so let's start going over it and see what we can find it's a bit of a pain to have to continuously stick this board back into the machine bend over the machine plug it in get the connectors all in just to test to see if something's working so what I'm gonna do is see how far I can go 
with uh, bench testing this thing because I can check for certain signals. So what I'm going to do is basically give it the unregulated 5 volts, which is the only power requirements that this board has. And uh, all that means, unregulated 5 volts, I think on the machines is about 10 volts DC that gets regulated to 5 volts over here. I got a bench supply that can supply up to 5 amps, but it only goes up to 8 volts. So 8 volts is more than sufficient to get the, the regulator working. And the only difference between it sitting on the bench and sitting on the actual power supply in the machine is that it's going to generate a bit less heat because the input voltage to the regulator is lower than uh, what, is, what it is in the machine. But it'll still let me test everything. So let's give it some power. Oh, that infernal noise. So let's enable power to it. And uh, the way I'm going to test this on the bench is this connector over here feeds the displays. Now this pin over here is the DMA clock. And we can see the DMA isn't running. These are the actual data bits for the display. And you can see there's no activity here. Second thing to test is these are the uh, light outputs over here. And they should be pulsing. As you can see, they're floating. And that's actually okay because the way this works is the lamps have power tied to one end at all times, and the other end is tied to one of these outputs, which are driven by these drivers. When the drivers are off, it's the output's floating, one of the sides of the bulbs is, based, is floating, and nothing is happening. In order to turn them on, the uh, respective buffer has to be enabled and then you'll see some pulsing over here. But as you can see the board is pretty dead. There's really nothing happening at all right now. And also note that I've left the infamous uh, shunt resistor in here. Yes, as much as I look at the design it just pains me that they did it this way, but they made thousands of these boards and uh, there, is, there is a reason for that resistor to be in here and I'm not going to try to redesign what the manufacturer did so my decision is I'm basically putting these shunt resistors back into every board I have and that's the way they ran for years and hopefully that's the way they'll continue running for years another issue is that without this resistor the uh, regulator is providing close to 3 amps and uh, that is I mean if it's still working if it's not going into thermal shutdown great but it is stressing the regulator and giving it this resistor sure makes things hot and we have a lot of wasted energy here but at least the regulator isn't going to get as stressed as it would be without the shunt resistor First and foremost, what does our voltage look like? And uh, I'm going to measure it right on the board. I'm going to measure the uh, power rails near the TTL, near some of the TTL, and see. We got 4.8 volts, a bit on the lower side, but uh, still sufficient to run the board. Yeah, this resistor is beginning to heat up. And to a much lesser degree, the regulator itself. So I guess the resistor is doing its job. I've also gone um, over all of the uh, bypass caps over here, which are all bent flat to the board. 
Since these things were not stored with great care, which was also part of why the uh, crystal broke off, and just to the general overview, is there anything funny looking on the board? Well, there's lots of funny looking things on the board, but uh, nothing that seems to indicate uh, a physical problem that would prevent it from working. So with that done, let's have a look at the processor. The reset line's high, and that's good. Is there a clock coming in? We're looking at phase one over here, and we can see phase one is dead. 6800 runs on a two-phase clock that's 180 degrees uh, out of phase, and it needs both of those clock signals. Phase 2 is running, but Phase 1 is dead, so the processor isn't working, and that's why there is nothing happening. So uh, let's start poking around a little bit and look at the uh, circuitry that generates the clock. So here's our clock generating circuitry. We've got the crystal over here and the associated buffers that make it oscillate. That is fed into a counter that divides the uh, clock signal. That in turn goes into a uh, one shot, and that's just there to do some pulse extension because I guess uh, the pulse, uh, the, the duty cycle of what's coming out of here may not be right. So this is giving you a proper pulse, and that goes into a uh, 7474 which is just a one bit latch with a clock and uh, a clock input and a data input and it is wired up as a divide by two and then when we look at the output of this it, it is generating the uh, two phase clock over here this part of the circuit uh, uh, need some explanation because essentially what they're doing here is implementing a poor man's delay line. So the unadulterated signal goes straight into this gate and then on the second path it utilizes the propagation delay in these two buffers to generate a pulse which essentially is your phase 2 clock and the same is the phase 1 clock. Now, we noticed that phase 1 is absent. Phase 2 is present and accounted for. So, our problem lies in here. So, let's have a look and see what the probe tells us. All right, so here's the flip-flop that's supposed to generate the uh, two clocks. And uh, pin 5, which is the Q output, generates phase 2. Now, we know that that seems to be working, but let's see what it looks like. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let me bring that a little more into focus. So it looks like we're getting a nice signal here. Now pin 6 is the uh, is the uh, Q bar output. And we can see that that looks kind of funny. It should look, it pretty much should look on the logic probe exactly the same as this one looks. But there's something wrong with this output. Or something down the line is loading it down. Because in this case, the Q bar also goes back to the data line on the flip-flop to uh, affect the divide by 2 effect. That was a mouthful. But, uh, so at this point, of course, the gut feel is, hey, let's rip this thing out and put a new one in. But I think we should first try to figure out, is it really this chip that's bad? Or is something down the line loading it down to the point? Another thing, of course, that helps a lot is to have a look on the scope. 
and see what the scope shows us these what what these signals look like so here's the uh, Q output one two three four five we are on two volts per division so it's swinging between uh, it's pretty much swinging between ground and 3 volts, which is a good signal. Now let's move on to pin 6. And look at that. It is, it is basically swinging between 2 and 4 volts. Yeah. Oh, come on. See, it doesn't want to trigger on it. Just happened to you. I just touched the wrong thing. Uh, and that pot's getting dirty again. Okay. So let's do this again and. Uh, Well, probing the wrong pin doesn't work. There it is. Let's see if I can get this thing to. There you go. So. Uh, so basically, we do have a frequency coming out, except it's swinging between two and 4 volts. So it's never reaching zero, so it's not triggering what's coming after it. So now we need to find out, yeah, is it this chip or is it something else doing this? And the easiest way to do that is to cut the pin. So I'm going to cut pin 6 close to the board after turning off power and the reason I'm cutting it close to the board is uh, I can reconnect it later by bending the pin back down and resoldering it if it turns out that this chip is not at fault Let's see, is that cut? Yes, it is. So now, well, it's not running, and that's because Q bar is connected to the data input. But we can clearly see that this pin, well, we can clearly see nothing right now. But that the, uh, the Q pin is high and Q bar is low. So it is able to go low, which leads me to believe that something further down the line is loading it down. So what does this connect to? Q bar connects to pin 3 on... Uh, where did it go? To C9, which is a uh, which is a Schmidt trigger buffer, pin three. So what we do is we find C9, which is here, and pin three is high. So my guess is my educated guess is that the uh, 7414 over here has a bad input see the input is high even though it's floating and so is the output so this guy seems to be the culprit so let's go ahead and replace him 
and not forget to reconnect the uh, pin we cut over here and see if that makes any difference. Power off. And we've done this before, so I'm going to do it off camera, but basically we are going to uh, cut all the pins, heat it up, remove the uh, leftover pins, and put a socket in here and put a new 7414 in and see if that helps us any. So, all we're going to do here is take a pair of side cutters and cut all the pins. and so on so it comes out then we then we clean up the holes socket it and see what happens next and then we have the fun part heat up the pad grab the errant pin or the remainder of it and pull it out. I'd also like to hear your comments if uh, this kind of detail is something you enjoy watching or should I just bypass it and make my life a lot easier by doing it off camera. But you can already see we've minimized stress on the board doing it this way. We're going to clear out the holes with solder wick, socket it, and be on our merry way. sitting on the ground plane and it needs more heat. Okay. So look at that. That's how you cleanly get rid of a uh, of a bad chip. Hopefully that was a bad chip, but uh, no board damage, uh, no lifted traces, nothing bad happening over here. Now you may want to ask why did I not use my desoldering tool and the reason for that is that it decided to quit on me about a week. Now it was about two weeks ago and even though I wrote a letter to Santa requesting a new one all I got was an ugly sweater so uh, I guess uh, for now we'll have to wait for the Easter Bunny and I'll just have to do this by hand. Another thing is, is I use a Q-tip to clean things up and look how dirty that is. I mean, the board is just incredibly dirty. You go anywhere, even though, you know, I've cleaned it up a little bit. Look at that. So it's going to need a bath. Because we don't know what sort of, uh, uh, what sort of dirt this is and what sort of conductive paths are still open on this board and may, may be causing us all sorts of trouble. But let's get the socket, let's fix the old connection, the cut connection over here, and uh, see if we see if we can get if we gotten any further. Alright, the 
got the socket in, got the chip replaced. Well, this better fix it because this was my last 14 pin socket. Uh, I'm going to have to start cutting down 16s. And I replaced the uh, cut connection over here by inserting a piece of uh, wire wrap wire to connect the pin to the pad. So, uh, let's see, let's give it some, plug in some power, plug in the probe, and away we go. So, here is the Q output that we saw working fine. And here's the cue bar output. So now we should be getting phase one, phase two, reset is high. So our DMA clock woke up. Ah, oh, crap. But there's no DMA data coming out. There seems to be some lamp data coming out. But the fact that the DMA to the display isn't working means we still got a problem. I'm not going to plug it in like that. So I just started poking around for signals because uh, things seemed to be working but the output wasn't good and then I stumbled across an inverter over here and uh, even without a scope if we probe one of the inputs here we're clearly getting a pulsating signal which you can't see so let's do this again. And the output's floating. So here's the next input. Output floating. Okay, so that inverter seems to have a has a little bit of a problem. Also when I was messing around with it, it does get pretty hot. So let's go in and replace that guy. Make sure we got the right one. It's E10, which is this one here. And before, one of the important things to do here is to mark the offending chip especially since it's neighbors the exact same type. So we'll mark it. We'll take it out just like we did before and see if that makes a difference. So I replaced the chip and uh, it does work correctly now but I poked around a little bit more while it was still on the bench, found that the guy next to it, which is a 7414, a Schmidt trigger uh, inverter, wasn't working either. The outputs weren't working right. I replaced that too, and uh, I finally did put it inside one of the machines, and uh, it did come up. The attract light sequences seem to work, the display lit up, which I initially verified by uh, looking at the uh, outputs on the board. What I did before over here to see here's the display stuff. All the lines are active and looking good and over here is the, uh, is the light bulbs. And that is correct behavior too. That is not used. 
I mean, they built this to drive a whole bunch of uh, lights, but as you can see, it's not populated over here, so that's why some of these outputs aren't going to be doing anything. But yeah, I verified that, that in the machine the lights work, it came up, but uh, <clears throat> none of the switches work. The test button didn't work. I mean, nothing, nothing at all. As far as input is concerned. So I brought it back to the bench and I started measuring and uh, found another weird chip over here. This is a 7404 inverter, and we all know how inverters are supposed to work, but the input's low, output's high, right? Okay, but that's where it ends on this one, because all the other ones, we have a low input and a low output. Low input, low output, and that repeats itself all over. So this chip is bad. Now what I think happened is, and I've seen this before, is the switch section is pretty messed up. I mean there's other, this whole top row of chips is supposed to generate uh, uh, control signals to read each switch singly and uh, for instance let's have a look at this one. This is happily, I mean, it's doing something. It's pulsing, right? So if you were just to check it this way, you would go, oh, okay, the chip is alive. But when we look at what the scope says, if I can get this to show the scope without being totally glared out, We will see that in this case, the logic probe was kind of misleading. Even though we could see the asymmetric behavior of the LEDs on there. So watch me put it. Look at that. The signal is high. It's sitting at just under, uh, well, it's sitting at about 3 volts. Look at all the garbage on there. And that seems to be happening quite a lot. Now we get a good ground on that one. We've got a clean high on that one. Low. These are all supposed to be high because these chips are one of eight selectors that activate a certain switch. So high is good. That's not good. Something stuck low. It shouldn't be low. So that, so what I'm poking around in is uh, showing us that there's there seem to be a lot of problems with the chips that generate the uh, scan signals for each switch. So here's what I think may have happened over here. This is the uh, connector where all of the switches come in and these are these are 8 to 1 selectors that act basically activate this is not a uh, row column thing but rather each switch is scanned individually and it looks like we have a lot of damage a lot of these chips up here seem to be acting up so, along of course with some other chips over here but what I think may have happened here is somebody was repairing some stuff under the play field with the game being turned on now the switches run on uh, they're powered by 5 volts however what may happen is let's say you're playing with a solenoid wire you're or you, you're pulling harnesses and things are touching that aren't uh, insulated properly or you just got a mess of wires hanging under the play field and things inadvertently touched so what happens is 
you connect the solenoid voltage, which is 44 volts, to one of the switches, which puts 44 volts into this connector. Now you would think that would probably isolate it to one switch, but that is a big assumption to make because the switch that's receiving the 44 volts is most likely going to get damaged, but it's going to pass on the 44 volts down the line, and that's why we're seeing so much weird damage over here. Like this guy, he's electrically, he's like two levels away from these inputs, but obviously he got fried too. So what I'm going to do is uh, pretty much shotgunning this. Anything that behaves weird will get replaced. And let's see if we can get back switch functionality. Alright, I don't remember exactly where I was at as far as replacing parts in the last scene, but uh, uh, a few hours have passed and I think I mentioned I should just go ahead and shotgun the uh, <clears throat> switch input section. I didn't do it, I analyzed it, but uh, it was quite a mess. And I'll show you the schematics, uh, what I think will support my theories about having the, uh, for the high voltage shorted to the switch, uh, to the switch inputs, but uh, I've replaced these BCD to decimal, I mean BCD, what are they called? BCD to decimal decoders, which are switching, sitting, which are driving the switch strobes this one, this one, this one, and this one. And I analyzed it uh, by seeing that signals going to or from them were corrupted. And uh, I cut a lot of traces, pins, and stuff like that to isolate which chips were bad till I got clean signals coming out of them using the scope. And it also took some other stuff with it downstream this one particularly, there was another bad inverter over here, but uh, it seems to be, the switch stuff seems to be working, but let's have a look at the schematics and see what happened here. So here's a part of the schematic that shows us where the uh, switch strobes are generated. Again, we don't have a switch matrix, but rather each switch is gets a ping from one of these lines. And uh, if the switch is closed, it returns an active, an active low on a common line. So since the processor knows which one of these is activated, if it gets an active back, then it knows that that switch is closed. And the way this works, we have these uh, BCD to decimal uh, 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 decoders. So each one of these chips can generate one low on one of the eight output lines. Well, it can generate a low or a high because the way they work is the first three lines select which one of these outputs is active and then the last line, the D line, is the actual data that gets output on those. And uh, this guy here selects which one of these, how many do we have, which one of these 10, what the data is going to each one of these 10 when they are selected. So that way you basically have 10 by 8, 10 times 8, or 80 strobes generated over here to drive the switches. Now. I think my theory about uh, the high voltage being fed through one of these inputs is probably correct because what I replaced here, first of all this part that uh, decides whether to put a low or high on, uh, on the respective strobe line, this was bad. These buffers were bad. And once I had these two replaced, I still saw some corruption on these lines that were common to all of these chips. 
So I started testing, cutting pins and traces and all of that till I identified which ones of these were bad. And once these were replaced, the data started looking good on here. So the data that was driving them was good and they were all actively creating strobes. So imagine this, that somebody mucked around under the play field and somehow, inadvertently or not, injected 40 volts or 44 volts, which is a solenoid voltage, into one of these strobe lines. You would think that if it happened to one of these chips, then the chip would just burn up and it would be a simple matter of replacing whichever chip got zapped, but that's not the way it works. What I think happened is when uh, one of these things got zapped, the uh, high voltage went through the chip and appeared on, this, on these bus lines, three of them common to all of them. So that's why several of these went bad, because the 40 volts, volts assuming it went in here, came out here and entered some of the other chips and zapped them. It also zapped this chip because it's connected to whichever one got the high voltage. It also zapped these inverters over here because they're connected to the bus. So I think that's the theory that uh, <clears throat> due to an unlucky circumstance, which does seem to happen quite a bit uh, on boards I've seen from different pinball manufacturers that uh, if you get the solenoid voltage connected to one of the switch inputs or outputs, serious damage results. Now in this case it looks like we got it. They're all pulsing. All these lines are clean as looked at from a scope. So we're getting close to actually testing this board. Two more things remaining were I put the proper ROMs and I'm going to test it in the space riders. And also, uh, even though the boards are identical, they're stuffed as far as the uh, Darlington's driving the solenoids. They're just, they're not all stuffed. They only, at the factory, stuffed the ones that a specific machine needed. And uh, I made sure that I have all of the uh, Darlington's in here that are necessary for space riders. So, uh, with all of that said, I can't think of anything more, and it's probably time to give this, this board a test in a machine. Okay, we are ready for the big test. I did some preliminary testing on this, and uh, the uh, switch matrix was still acting up. Even though the logic probe and the scope said that everything looked to be okay, it still wasn't. And uh, I had to replace some more of the driver chips. This one and this one. Because I basically there were some switches that went bananas. One of the switches actually triggered like eight other switches simultaneously which in the test the test mode showed me unfortunately one of those switches that also double or triggered simultaneously was the slam switch so every time I hit a target a certain target in the game the entire game would reset I just traced I made the assumption that the driver chips even though they look good on the bench uh, were also taken by the voltage jolt they got. So I just traced where the switches went through and they were two chips that I had not replaced earlier. So finally let's see now if uh, if the machine or the board I should say is fully functional. And that just brings up a good point when you're fixing a pinball board that's dealing with external solenoids, lights and switches. The only true test of the finished product is putting it into a machine. Bench fixing these uh, boards is not going to guarantee you that you have a well behaved board. Alright, here we go.
things seem to be working. So now the switch in question was this switch over here. Yeah, right. When you hit that switch, the slam switch got triggered. And then this slingshot didn't work at all. I mean, it worked in the uh, solenoid test, but the switches wouldn't trigger. But it looks like everything is good now. itself. All right, looks like we fixed it. Took a little longer than I would have preferred, but uh, the uh, switch matrix or the switch uh, strobe damage was pretty bad and uh, that is something that unfortunately happens I've seen that on several other machines not just Atari's other machines too but the damage was probably the most severe on the way the Atari board was laid out so uh, thanks for watching now you have a better idea of what it'll take to diagnose and fix one of these boards uh, use your thumbs in the proper direction, subscribe, and leave me a comment. We'll see you next time. Bonus footage. Here are the victims that uh, obviously didn't make the grade. As you can see, they all have their legs cut off, except this guy over here. I took him out whole. It's a 9301 decoder. They're kind of getting a bit rare to find. There's one or two available on eBay, but uh, none of the supply houses, none of the vintage electronics places seem to have them any, anymore. And if they do, they're pretty expensive. But anyway, here you're looking at the source of the problem, the board head.